Assalamu alaikum. alaikum. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today we have two lectures. Uh, the first one will be pacemaker and defibrillator therapy in cardiac surgery, presented by Dr. Sara Al Laboon. And the second lecture will be pacemaker related complications to be presented by Dr. Shada Al Mutlaq. Our uh, guest consultant today is Dr. Rajan Shodari, consultant cardiologist and electrophysiologist from King Abdullah Medical City in Mecca. Um, Dr. Asara, whenever you're ready, uh, please share your slides and we'll start at 1.05 as usual. Yeah, okay, sure, we start at Sarah, please start. Okay, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Assalamu uh, alaikum Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Sarah Laboon, uh, R1 cardiac surgeon in uh, King Abdullah Medical City. Before I start my presentation, I would just like to welcome uh, Dr. Rajin. He is our consultant cardiologist, electrophysiologist. He will be our supervisor today. Uh, thank you for coming, Dr. Rajin. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Okay. Uh, our topic today is going to be about pacemaker and defibrillator in cardiac surgery. So this is going to be our uh, objective. We're going to talk about injured, small, uh, small talking about injured conduction system, pacemakers, ICD, CRT, and WCT. Okay. So the conduction system is uh, vulnerable to uh, injury during heart surgery. Complete heart block, complete heart block can result from a suture placement during aortic mitral or tricuspid valve surgery, septal defect closure, or from myometomy. Infraction to the conduction system or inadequate myocardial protection or trauma from retraction can also result in a surgical iatrogenic heart block. So we can see here due to, an atom, uh, due to the anatomical side of the bundle of uh, pits below the non-coronary, right coronary aortic commissure, and during mitral surgery, the bundles of his are gonna be in the ventricular septum, anterior media to the posterior, the posterior commissure and the right fibron trigots. Okay, let's start now about the pacemaker. Pacemaker are electronic devices that stimulate the heart with electric impulse to maintain or restore normal heartbeats. In 1952, Rizal described an effective means of supporting the patient with intrinsic cardiac pacemaker activity and or conducting, the, conducting tissue by an artificial electronic external pacemaker. In 1957, a complete heart block was treated using electrical directly attached to the heart. All cardiac pacemaker consists of two components, the pulse generator, which provides the electrical impulse for myocardial stimulation, and one or more electrode, uh, electrode leads, uh, which deliver the electrical impulse from the generator to the myocardium. Uh, our guideline I'm going to talk about today is based on the 2021 European Society of Cardiology guideline on cardiac pacing and cardiac resynchronization therapy. So first, let's talk about indication in card in, uh, for pacemaker. So for the sake of time, I'm going to talk only about the class one indication. Uh, 
So starting here for the recommendation of basic in uh, sinus node dysfunction, uh, it's a class one indication in patient with SN, uh, sinus node dysfunction and a DDD based maker minimization of unnecessary ventricular basing through programming that is recommended as a class one indication. Basing is indicated in SND when symptoms can clearly uh, be attributed to bradyarrhythmia. Basing is also indicated in symptomatic patient with a bradycardia tachycardia from an SND and in order to correct a bradyarrhythmia and enable pharmacological treatment unless ablation of the tachyarrhythmia is preferred. A recommendation for basing for atrial ventricular block. Basing is indicated in patient with uh, sinus rhythm with permanent or paroxysmal third or second degree type 2 infernodal 2 to 1 or high degree AV, AV block, irrespective of symptoms. Basing is also indicated in patients with atrial arrhythmia, mainly AFib, and permanent or paroxysmal third or high degree AV ventricular block, irrespective of symptoms. Also in patients with a permanent AVIP and need of pacemaker ventricular pacing with rate response function is recommended. For, pa for patient uh, recommended for pacing for, with, uh, for reflex syncope, a dual chamber cardiac pacing is indicated to reduce a recurrent syncope in patient aged more than 40 years with severe and predictable recurrent syncope who have spontaneous documented symptomatic systolic pressure more than three or, or asymptomatic pause more than six seconds due to sinus arrest or AP block or cardio inhibitory carotid sinus syndrome or asystolic syncope during te testing. For pacing in patient with frontal branch block, it's a class one indication in patient with unexpected, un sorry, unexplained syncope and by particular block, a pacemaker is indicated in the presence of either a baseline, uh, 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 his, uh, his bundle venter, uh, ventricular rate of more than 70, rate, more than 70 millisecond, second or third degree intra or infrahism block during intramental atrial pacing or abnormal response to pharmacological challenge. Patient uh, indicates also for pacing in, with alternative uh, bundle, plash, bundle branch block with or without symptoms. For indication in specific condition, uh, implantation of permanent pacemaker is indicated with the same recommendation when an AV block does not resolve within a waiting period of at least five days after EMI. Also, in after cardiac surgery, a high degree or complete AV block after cardiac surgery, a period of clinical observation for at least five days is indicated in order to assess whether the rhythm disturbance is transit or resolves. However, in case of complete AV block with a low or no escape rhythm where resolution is unlikely, this observation period can be shortened. In a transcatheter aortic valve implantation, permanent pacing is recommended in patients with complete or high degree AV block that persists for 24 up to 48 hours after TAVI. Also, permanent pacing is recommended in patients with a new onset alternative bundle branch block after TAVI. Uh, regarding a temporary cardiac pacing, temporary transvenous pacing is recommended in case of hemodynamic compromising by the arrhythmia uh, refractory to intravenous coronary tract. In patients with congenital heart disease, in uh, a high degree AV block pacing is recommended if one of the following risk symptoms uh, or factors is present. If patient is symptomatic, if there's a pause more than three by cycle length of ventricular escape rhythm, if there's a broad QRS escape rhythm, if there's a prolonged QT interval, complex ventricular activity, or a mean daytime heart rate less than 50 beat per minute. So we have two types, mainly the general uh, classification of pacemaker, we have two types, implantable or external pacemaker. For the implantable, the internal pacemaker, the pulse generator is implanted in the subcutaneous tissue and the electrical stimulation is passed to the heart through the pacing leads by gaining access, access to any of the pain, right internal sugar, axillary pain, cephalic pain, or subcalibre pain. For the external type, we can do through two axes, the transvenous one, which is a temporary endocardial lead usually are introduced via a sheet system in the jugular or the subclavian pain. The right internal jugular pain is generally the pain choice as it allows for easy passage of the passing lead through the right atrium and into the right ventricle. For the epicardial type of the external pacemaker, it's similarly atrial or ventricular epicardial pacing wires are passed superficially through the epicardial surface, which the atrial wires secured superficially with the uh, blurine sutures. The duration of capture with these wires varies, but most start to fail after a week or two. Once they have no longer are needed, they generally are extracted with the traction applied to the leads as they emerge from the thorax. Uh, 
This usually causes a suture break or the lead to pull out from the epicardial suture, and they usually does not cause any bleeding. So let's talk about now codes. There's an international pacemaker code. Uh, it's composed of three letters. The, very one, the first one is going to be about the chamber that's actually based. So it's either A, atrium, V, ventricle, door, O, or S. S means single. So uh, the next letter would be where's the, where's the chamber is actually sensed? It's either ent uh, atrium, ventricle, dual, or none. For the algorithm or the basing, the third one is where actually we are basing if it's, uh, or, uh, or even uh, the program going to be if it's either uh, a trigger, inhibition, dual, or none. So we can divide the modes of the pacemaker to two types, a single chamber modes or, and the dual chamber modes. So let's start by the single chamber modes with the first one is VOO. So uh, as we can uh, uh, understand from the codes, V is gonna it's be, it mean that it's gonna sense in the ventricle. It's gonna be, in the, the, it's gonna base in the, sorry, it's gonna base in the ventricle, but there's gonna be no sensing or response to that. So here we can see, the first one is the, uh, the in this, uh, uh, here we can see it's the base maker is actually set to 60 beat per minute. So uh, as there is no sensing, it starts, uh, the base maker is gonna start the rhythm regardless of the intrinsic beat. With the red arrow here, we can see that the basing spikes start to the, uh, to start the, uh, the ventricular basing, uh, regardless of the, uh, showing that white color is after that, regardless of the uh, patient intrinsic beat. Then, as it follows by uh, with the green arrow as an intrinsic beat, but since it's the mode is VOO, which is an asynchronization mode, so regardless of that, it's gonna also follow by a pacing spike spacing the ventricle and continue to that as there is no sensing. The second mode is VII, uh, so it's uh, basing in the ventricle, sensing also in the ventricle, but there is an inhibition. This mode is also called the demand mode. Here is also set for 60 beat per minute. And as you can see, the first beat is an intrinsic uh, be, uh, beat, ventricular beat. So the base maker sends that and inhibit the basing. So there, we can see here, or we can appreciate there is no basing spikes, basing spikes to base the ventricle. Then again, the uh, the base maker since there is an intrinsic ventricular beat, so an inhibition happened and there is no basing spikes. After a period of time to the set rhythm, the base maker since there, there is no intrinsic beat, so start uh, basing the ventricle, showing a basing spikes followed by a vent uh, followed by the white is based on uh, the base maker shooting. After that, it's gonna sense again, since there is no intrinsic beat, again, we can see a uh, basing spike happen again. Here we have a BVC uh, also sensed as a ventricular intrinsic beat. So no shooting with the pacemaker happened. Again, for after a, of, after a period of time, there is no intrinsic beat, ventricular uh, pacemaker start shooting, basing the ventricle. Moving on to uh, the atrial mode, we're starting with the AOO. So it's gonna be in the atrium, sensing will be off and there is no response. So once again, we have here the base maker is gonna, it's programmed to rate, uh, programmed to a rate, specific rate, regardless of the, inter, of the heart intrinsic activity. So the same here, the base maker is set to seven beats per minute. So regardless of the intrinsic uh, atrial activity, it will continue to show a basing spikes, basing the atrium up to a fixed rate. Okay, moving on to the next atrial mode, which is AII. Uh, so here, it's gonna, there will be basing in the atrium, sensing in the atrium, and there's gonna be an inhibition. Also this one called an inhibition, uh, uh, sorry, a demand mode. So for this one, um, sorry, so for this one, uh, we can appreciate this. Uh, there is uh, intrinsic atrial uh, activity. It's sensed by the pacemaker, so it, so it inhibits the basing of the atrium. Followed by the period of time 
again, another intrinsic atrial bleed happened. So inhibition happened and there is no pacing of the atrium. Again, after a period of time, there is no intrinsic bead. So pacing spike, uh, pacing the atrium happened and continue. Again, there is no intrinsic bead, pacing the atrium happened. Okay, moving on to uh, D, uh, yeah, DDD mode. So we are moving to the dual chamber mode. Uh, this one is called the tracking mode. Uh, here also, the, we have, uh, since it's a dual chamber uh, uh, mode, we can see that it's going to be pacing in the atrium and the ventricle. It's going to be sense in the atrium and the ventricle. And regarding the response, it's going to inhibit and trigger. So what does that mean? Uh, when there is an intrinsic B wave, uh, the QRS can inhibit the pacing. And when there is an intrinsic also B wave, there is going to be uh, a triggering of the AV delay. So uh, this uh, actually this mode is going to be uh, the truly adapt of the heart. What is the heart actually is doing? Pacemaker going to be mimic a normal conduction as closely as possible. So let's start here. It's also set in 60 beats per minute. First, we can appreciate an atrial uh, intrinsic uh, activity. So uh, it, there are going to be an inhibition occurring, followed by an AV delay. Then there happened an, another intrinsic uh, ventricular activity. So inhibition occurred. There is, so we can see here there is no pacing to the atrial or to the ventricle. After a period of time, there was no uh, atrial activity. So uh, pacing spikes uh, or pacing to the atrium will happen, followed by an AV delay. But at this time, we can see there is an intrinsic ventricular activity. So inhibition will be happened to the ventricle. After a period of time also, there was no electric, uh, atrial activity. So uh, pacing the atrium will be, uh, uh, there's so gonna be a pacing to the atrium followed by an AV delay. But this time also there is no, there is no sensing uh, for the ventricular activity. So pacing to the ventricle is occurring here. Yeah, sorry. So uh, uh, that's, that actually concludes the dual chamber. It's, it's uh, as close as possible. It's gonna be monitoring and sensing basing the heart. For the next mode, the VDD mode, also it's calling the tracking mode. So it's gonna base the ventricle only, but it's gonna sense in the both atrium and the ventricle. So it's gonna inhibit or trigger. So when there is an intrinsic URS, it's gonna inhibit the ventricular basing and as it's sensing in both atrial and ventricle, whenever there is a, it's sensing a B wave, an intrinsic B wave, it's gonna trigger an AV delay, but there will gonna be no pacing in the atrium. So here we can see an atrial, uh, intrinsic uh, atrial activity is sensed. So uh, uh, a triggering of the AV delay is gonna happen. Then uh, there is an intrinsic uh, ventricular activity and that will inhibit a pacing to the ventricle. After a set rhythm, there was no uh, uh, intrinsic ventricular activity. So, uh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, after a period of time, there, we can appreciate that there is an intrinsic atrial activity again, uh, atrial, uh, activity again uh, followed by AV delay. Then after that, there, uh, there is no uh, intrinsic ventricular activity. So pacing to the ventricle happened here. Again, after a period of time, we uh, sensed an intrinsic atrial activity, so we trigger an AV delay, but there is no intrinsic ventricular activity, so basing to the ventricle habit. Moving on here, uh, we can see a BVC that's sensed as uh, intrinsic ventricular activity, but after a period of time, there is no uh, atrial activity sensed or a ventricular activity sensed, so pacing to the ventricle happened. Although here there was no intrinsic uh, atrial activity, but since the, this mode is actually only pacing the ventricle, so regardless of the atrial activity, if it's present or absent, it's not gonna base the atrium. So uh, moving on to the DDI uh, mode. So it's gonna base the atrium and the ventricle, sensing the atrium and the ventricle, and response to, this, uh, response to the sensing will be an inhibition. 
So it will, uh, this one is going to be a bit tricky. Uh, it will work as if you have an AAI and a VBI based maker operation together at the same, at the same time, but they are independent to each other. Okay, let's see here. So first we have an HRL base. Then the, uh, the base maker start an AB delay before basing the ventricle as it's not sensing any ventricular activity. Then the atrial sits the rhythm, so it's not sensing any intrinsic atrial activity. So it starts pacing the atrium, followed by an AV delay. Then after uh, a sits rhythm, follow, uh, sensing, start uh, trying to sense the ventricle, there is no intrinsic ventricular activity. So another uh, pacing to the ventricle will be happening. Uh, here we have an intrinsic atrial activity. But as uh, but there is no AV delay, so the ventricle will be paced. Sorry, so the ventricle will be paced after cyst rhythm, uh, regardless of the uh, it is, uh, intrinsic activity. So each system is actually working on its own. The uh, as we as we said earlier, it's work as AAI and BVI together. The last one is DOO mode is going to base the atrium and the ventricle but there is no sensing and there is no response. So this mode will result in uh, AV sequential pacing at the lower rate. It uh, limits regardless of the heart own intrinsic activity. It's an asynchronous pacing mode. So here we have a pacemaker sits to the rate of 60 beats per minute with an AV delay of 200 millisecond. So pacing of the atrium happen followed by a set rate of AV delay, which as we said earlier, 200 millisecond followed by a ventricular activity. This circle will happen again and again as there is no sensing and no response. So again, there is a ventricular, uh, there is a ventricular pacing after set rhythm, followed by a set uh, AV delay of 200 millisecond, then a ventricular pacing. So you can appreciate that, that uh, even, if, even if there is an, a BPC, an intrinsic ventricular activity, there is, as there is no sensing, there is no response to that intrinsic activity. So uh, regarding the management of pacing wires after cardiac surgery, uh, there is an advantage of a bipolar. It's required less energy to base as a less inflammation around the wire and myocardium interference. There is required less potential of bringing myocardium to the threshold and uh, required a uh, less potential, uh, required more suitable for use of dual chamber applications. It's less susceptible to interference when performing sensing function. For the disadvantage, the smaller current, smaller basing spikes on ACG, uh, but it requires daily check up of basing is, uh, if it's uh, daily checking of the rhythm sensitivity, if it's captured and checking the battery. Moving to the implantable cardioversity defibrillator, the ICD. Defibrillation was described as effectively treat ventricular fibrillation while delivering directly to the heart after thoracotomy in 1947. The main function of the ICD is to protect the patient against death from ventricular tachyarrhythmia by delivering a cardioverting or defibrillation, defibrillating shock and or atrial ventricular pacing. Sorry, anti-tachycardia uh, anti uh, anti pacing. When the ventricular rate exceeds the program threshold, the device delivers a shock to uh, restore the normal heart. Uh, here we can see an indication as a class one indication for the ICD. Uh, it's indicated in patients who are survived uh, of cardiac arrest due to a ventricular fibrillation or hemodynamically unstable, sustained PT after evaluation to define the cause of the event and to exclude any completely reversible cause. Is also indicated in patients with a structural heart disease and spontaneous sustained VT, whether hemodynamically stable or unstable. Also indicated in patients with syncope of, un, uh, of un, uh, uh, the undetermined origin with clinically relevant hemodynamically significant sustained PTE or BB, PF induced at electrophysiological study. ICD also indicated in patients with lymphatic fraction less than or equal to 35% to, uh, to superior MI who are at least 40 days post-MI and are NYHA cl uh, uh, function classification two or three. Uh, 
ICD uh, indicated in patients with non ischemic uh, duodenal surgery uh, who have a uh, left ventricular ejection fraction less than or equal to 35% and who, who are in which I classification class two or three. It's also indicated in patients with different ventricular dysfunction due to prior MI who are at least 40 days post MI who have different ventricular fracture less than or equal to 30% and are in YHA class 1. Finally, it's indicated as a class 1 in patients with non-sustained BT due to prior MI left ventricular fracture less than or equal to 40% and insuperable ventricular fibrillation or sustained BT at electrophysiological study. So uh, ICD, we're going to talk about the ICD in prevention of uh, sudden cardiac de death. We have secondary and primary prevention. In secondary prevention, it's referred to a prevention of uh, sudden cardiac death in those patients who have survived a prior cardiac arrest or sustained ventricular tachycardia. Primary prevention refers to a prevention of sudden cardiac death in an individual without a history of cardiac arrest or sustained PT, patients with a cardiac condition associated with a high risk of sudden death, who have unexplained syncope that is likely to be due to a ventricular arrhythmia, as considered to have a secondary indication. And in certain circumstances, such as a lack of venous access, repeated uh, infection, lack of need of pacing, and uh, only shocking capability needed, a subcutaneous ICD, it calls SICD, can be placed. So we here we have a secondary prevention ICD clinical trial. The early trial of ICD were uh, conducted to enroll patients who have uh, survived a VTE or a ventricular fibrillation uh, and those patients who are at high risk of recurrent. So the first study we have, the AVID antiarrhythmic uh, versus implantable defibrillator trial. It was conducted in the United States in 1997 enrolled 1,016 patients who survived the uh, ventricular fibrillation or had an experienced BT uh, combined by either syncope or left ventricular ejection fraction uh, of uh, less than or equal to 40%. Uh, it compared an ICD with an antiarrhythmic therapy, primary amiodarone, following patient over two years. Here, as we see, the results show the significant survival benefit of ICD with an absolute reduction of death with a 7% and the relative risk reduction of 27%. The second study we have CID, uh, CIDS, a Canadian implantable defibrillator study. It was published in 2000. Uh, patients were included, those with ventricular fibrillation out of uh, hospital of cardiac arrest due to ventricular fibrillation, ventricular tachycardia, ventricular tachycardia with syncope, or ventricular tachycardia with symptoms uh, and lip ventricular ejection fraction of um, this time we equal 35 or unmonitored syncope with subsequent spontaneous or induced ventricular uh, tachycardia. This study uh, actually was terminated early, uh, so the result here does not reach a statistical significant. It was followed only for two years with a survival uh, benefit actually resulting, uh, showing more to the ICD. Uh, it compared the ICD with amiodarone. Uh, it resulted with an absolute risk reduction with 2% and relative risk reduction with approximately 20%. The third one is the uh, CASH uh, trial. is the cardiac arrest study of Pumper, which was conducted in Germany over nine years. It published in 2000. Uh, um, it enrolled patients with who survived ventricular fibrillation but the ventricular tachycardia. It has, a smaller, it has a smaller population with 288 patients, uh, but it resulted with an absolute risk reduction of 8% and relative risk reduction with a 23%. So all of these secondary prevention trials were conducted in a very similar patient population and produced a similar result confirming the superiority um, of an ICD therapy over a medical therapy at that time. For the primary prevention trial, uh, here we have a few. The first one is the RC, uh, the one was, was an uh, clinical trial. Uh, the multi the MADID, the multi center automatic defibrillator uh, implantation trial. It was reported in 1996. Uh, this uh, it enrolled patient uh, with coronary artery disease, the prior MI with a left ventricular ejection fraction not greater than 35 percent, and then sustained VT and ambulatory monitoring, VT inducible uh, by programmed simulation and failure to intravenous brokinamide to suppress a ventricular tachycardia. Uh, 
it enrolled patient uh, 19, uh, with, uh, 196 patients, uh, followed for two years and with a, uh, uh, showing a benefit of uh, ICD therapy with an absolute risk reduction 90% and relative risk reduction 59%. Another trial is the MAS trial, a multicenter and sustained trachycardia trial. Uh, patient, it enrolled patient with a history of myocardial infraction, left ventricular ejection fraction of less than 40%, and has, uh, an unsustained ventricular tachycardia and inducible ventricular tachycardia despite an anti arrhythmic therapy. This trial uh, followed for five years of treatment. Uh, on patient, uh, uh, it shows a relative risk reduction of uh, 58% and absolute risk reduction of 31. The cabbage patch trial, the coronary artery bypass graft patch, evaluates the benefit of ICD in coronary artery disease, disease patient who underwent non emergent coronary artery bypass surgery and who have lifted the rejection fraction less than 36 and abnormal signal average electrocardiogram. It, it followed for uh, two years, and there was no evidence that a prophylactic ICD implantation in patient undergoing elective surgical revascularization uh, conferred a survival benefit in comparing patients with the standard medical therapy. The MADI-2 uh, trial it ev uh, evaluated ICD in lower, uh, lower risk patient population than those of uh, the previous study, the MADI-1, and uh, MUST. It consisted of patients with a prior myocardial infraction and lift ventricular ejection fraction less than uh, 38%. So for this module two, it showed uh, it, followed, it was followed for two years with an absolute uh, risk reduction of 6% and relative risk reduction of 31%. The next one is a uh, uh, dynamic trial, defibrillator in acute myocardial infraction trial. It examined the potential benefit of ICD uh, early after myocardial infraction in coronary artery disease patient with a left ventricular ejection fraction of 35 or less, and patient who uh, had depressed heart rate by uh, viability of an average of elevated average of 24 hours heart rate more than 80 percent uh, 80 per minute, and uh, it was followed for two and a half years uh, with no survival benefit from ICD uh, implantation. The next one is the, the, the defibrillator in non-ischemic cardiomyopathy treatment evaluation trial. It was published in 2004. It investigated ICD uh, in patients with a non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. This patient had a history of a heart failure of uh, the left ventricular ejection fraction less than 30, uh, 36, and uh, evidence of uh, uh, anti uh, I'm sorry, and evidence of uh, an, uh, anti arrhythmia with more than more than 10% premature particular complex per hour or necessary particular tachycardia. The trial result of an absolute risk factor of 6% and relative risk of 44. The next one is the sudden cardiac death heart failure trial. Uh, it was the largest primary prevention clinical trial of an ICD. The investigation, uh, this trial, oh, sorry, the, this uh, trial enrolled 2,521 patients with a non-ischemic or ischemic cardiomyopathy, lift twenty ejection fraction of 35% or less, and in which a class two, a class two or three uh, conscious heart failure. All patients were monitored for about five years, uh, and this trial was actually published in 2005. Overall, the absolute risk reduction was 7%, and the relative risk reduction was 23%. The next one is the comparison of medical therapy basing and defibrillator in heart uh, failure trial uh, for a patient with different ejection fraction, uh, less than 35%, and QRS duration more than 120 milliseconds, and one check class three or four, uh, the patient were randomly assigned to uh, CRT alone or CRT with the defibrillator CRTD. For this trial, it shows uh, an absolute, it was full for one year and uh, showed an absolute risk reduction of 12%, a relative risk reduction was 40%. The last one, or the most recently one, actually, the MITED CRT trial. Uh, this result of, uh, was published in 2009, uh, uh, evaluated the use of CRTD, and this, uh, this investigation enrolled 
1,820 patients with an ischemic or non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, a left ventricular ejection fraction of 30% or less, and QRS duration of at least 130 millisecond, and in one HA class one or two. Uh, for this patient, uh, for the, sorry, for this trial, uh, the absolute risk reduction was 8%, and uh, relative risk reduction was 34%. So moving on to the cardiac desynchronization therapy, the CRT. Cardiac desynchrony is a different from a timing of electrical and mechanical activation of the ventricles, which can result in impaired cardiac efficiency. CRT deliver a biventricular pacing to correct the electromechanical desynchrony in order to increase the cardiac output and it has shown a significant morbidity and mobility benefit in specific patient group with a reduced different ejection fraction. It can be either CRT based maker CRTB uh, or by combined CRT implantable cardioverter defibrillator CRTD. CRT device include a transvenous pacing lead placed in, uh, in a, a bunch of the coronary sinus of, for the left ventricle pacing in addition, in addition to leads in the right ventricle and the right atrium. So talking about the indication of the CRT uh, for the class one indication is recommended for a symptomatic patient with a heart failure in uh, sinus rhythm with a different decontraction fraction less than or equal to 35%. QR is duration more than 150 milliseconds and different flash for QR is morphology despite the optimal uh, medical therapy in order to improve the symptoms and reduce the morbidity and mortality. It's also recommended in patients who are candidate for an ICD and who are and who have CRT indication. Implantation of CRTD is actually recommended. CRT rather than uh, right ventricular pacing is recommended for patients with uh, heart failure ejection fraction less than forty uh, percent, regardless of the NYHA class who have an indication for the ventricular pacing and high degree uh, AP block in order to reduce the morbidity. Uh, uh, this also includes patients with AFib. For the wearable cardioverter uh, defibrillator, the WCD, some patients who are at risk of sudden cardiac death do not meet the established criteria for the implantation of ICD or may require only short term protection. Um, for this patient or for this patient waiting for a subsequent ICD insertion or a cardiac uh, transplantation, in such setting, the wearable cardioverter defibrillator, the WCD, uh, may be preferable. It's an non-invasive jacket device which can detect and terminate hemodynamically relevant ventricular tachycardia and ventricular populations. Here I have a study that was published in 2021 May uh, regarding a wearable cardioverter defibrillator multicenter experience in a large cardiac surgery cohort at transit risk of sudden cardiac death. Um, they aim to investigate the WBC as the WCD used in cardiac surgery in patients with uh, science data for this uh, 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 science data. Sorry for uh, for cardiac surgery regarding a risk of potential sudden cardiac death. Their conclusion is the risk of sudden cardiac death is uh, uh, substantial within the first three months after cardiac surgery. Patients were protected effectively by WCD due to a significant lymphatic conjunction fraction improvement with the majority did not require an ICD implantation after the WCD use. Compliance was high despite the sternotomy. Uh, this multicenter experience confirmed existing data regarding effectiveness, safety, and compliance. Therefore, WCD sh could, should be considered in cardiac surgery patients with a severely reduced different ejection fraction. Uh, a CID, uh, cardiac implantation electronic devices, uh, impedance based are resp uh, responsive pacing function. Uh, it interferes from a diathermy or manipulation of the device can be sensed by implant resulting in an inappropriate high rate pacing. So temporary programming the device to an ungrade response mode will prevent this. Manufacture of an implantable base maker on ICD either con uh, contraindicated the use of surgical diathermy or electrocutory or give strong warning against its use especially with a, a unipolar uh, mode of the operation, with the use of bipolar surgical data or recovery should be considered in a preference to a unipolar whether it's possible. Implantable loop records are uh, insertable cardiac monitors monitor cardiac signal and there is no risk to a patient with 
a new surgical procedure. Regarding the radiotherapy, pacemaker and ICD may sustain damage uh, or have their functionally affected by a course of radiation therapy. Radiotherapy uh, beams may damage the device battery and or circuitry causing a malfunction. This may lead to inhibition of the basic therapy or an appropriate shock with an ICD. For the mounted response, most pacemaker response with a fixed rate asynchronous pacing while uh, a magnet is held over the generator, which can be useful in a rare situation where the pacing is inhibiting a diathermy, leaving a magnet over the pacemaker is not generally recommended. The asynchronous pacing can uh, occasionally be uh, arrhythmogenic. For an ICD, pacing a magnet over the device will inhibit the delivery of anti-tachycardia pacing and shock therapy, but will have a no effect on the bradycardia pacing. Placing a magnet directly over the pacemaker will switch its mode to asynchronous. So from AAI, it's going to be converted to AOO, BVI is going to be BOO, and DDD is going to be converted to a DOO. Here we have a magnet turn sensing often set based on the synchronous mode. We can see here the red arrow signal, uh, the atrial beat, followed by a ventricular pacing uh, spikes the, and base stimulus ventricular complex. So after uh, applying the magnet over the generator, the sensing function of the pacemaker is turned off. As you can see in the green arrow, it demonstrates an asynchronous atrial and ventricular base spikes. So lastly, uh, about the MRI and the apocardial wire, uh, so it, uh, it cannot be performed on a patient dependent on a temporary pacemaker, as there is going to be too much ferrous material in generators. But can patients with a retained epicardial leads have an MRI? According to the study, it, uh, um, uh, it was published in the American Journal of Radiology in 1997, none of the 51 patients experienced arrhythmia or other cardiac dysfunction during MI, MRI. Sorry. Uh, diagnostic benefit must be outweighing the risk, and an epicardial way are not contraindication for MRI. So uh, that concludes my uh, presentation about pacemaker and uh, defibrillator and cardiac surgery. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Dr. Asara. Um, uh, anyone has any questions for Dr. Asara or for Dr. Raji? I would just like to uh, comment and congratulate Dr. Sarah. Uh, this, uh, it was supposed to be a R1 presentation, but I think you have uh, outdone and it's much higher quality. And especially I love those, uh, how you explain the modes of functioning of the pacemaker and ICD. Uh, very uh, amazingly done with animation. That's a great thing. And you have also explained some nice trials. You touched on the trials, uh, sudden cardiac death. Uh, ICD prevents death, uh, sudden cardiac deaths, uh, because it has been proved. So um, it's a good thing uh, to consider the primary and secondary prevention. Uh, you have shown on the epicardial wires, you have touched on the modes and uh, troubleshooting. Uh, excellent presentation, I would say. Uh, if anyone has any questions, uh, the floor is open for any questions. Okay, uh, it seems the lecture was uh, very good. Nobody has any questions. Um, uh, we'll uh, resume with the next uh, lecture with Dr. Rashada at around um, 2 p.m. So we'll take a short break now. Thank you, Dr. Rajin, for your time. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Dr. Rashada, uh, you can go ahead and start. Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Today, my topic uh, about pacemaker uh, complication. I'm Shadan Matlag, R3 resident in King Faisal uh, Specialist Hospital. So this is a brief um, introduction, which was done by Dr. Sarah already. So starting with the complication, uh, the risk of complication exists with any invasive procedure. Overall complication occur in 1% to 6% of all pacemaker implantation procedures. Uh, complication can range from superficial bleeding to fatal infection or cardiac arrest. So we can divide pacemaker complication to uh, two ways, uh, mechanical factors and pacemaker malfunction. Uh, mechanical factors like pneumothorax, hematoma, tricuspid regurgitation, uh, bucket or systemic infection, thrombophlebitis, myocardial uh, perforation, lead dislodgement or break, and pacemaker malfunction like failure to base, failure to capture, inappropriate sensing, over or under sensing, dysarrhythmia, and pacemaker syndrome. Starting with the mechanical factors, Start, uh, pneumothorax is often asymptomatic and this uh, covered on a routine post procedure chest x ray. Uh, severe respiratory distress, pleuritic chest pain, and cough suggest uh, the diagnosis. If it exists uh, and uh, is, um, if it extends is greater than 10% of our uh, small pneumothorax, does not resolve or enlarge uh, on a serial uh, chest x ray. Evacuation is indicated. Like in this picture, there is a, a pacemaker implantation was done and there is a pneumothorax in the right lung. And here, this is another patient with pacemaker implantation and this is a pneumothorax in the left lung. Hematoma incidence from 0.5 to 3%. Patients who are on antithrombotic or anticoagulant therapy have slightly higher rate of bleeding and hematoma formation. Management, uh, most hematoma are treated conservatively with a local compressive uh, dressing. Exploration is only indicated if hematoma expand significantly and cause wound dehiscence and or necrosis. This is patient post pacemaker implantation and there is a hematoma. Tricuspid regurgitation incidence 16%. Uh, Tricuspid regurgitation is a common pacemaker related complication. It can occur from the damage of the valve during pacemaker insertion or from prevention of tricuspid valve closure during systole. It should be considered in patients uh, present with a new congestive heart failure. So management uh, with loop diuretics, furosemide, like first-line treatment for TR, causing congestive heart failure, and follow-up with cardiologist. This is an echo for the patient before pacemaker implantation. We can see here, uh, this is the tricuspid valve showing a trace, a tricuspid regurgitation. After uh, pacemaker implantation, this is, you can see here the lead of the pacemaker and showed a significant uh, tricuspid regurgitation. After pacemaker uh, lead extraction also showed severe tricuspid regurgitation. Bucket or systemic infection incidence uh, from one to three percent. Uh, patient can have bucket infection where the pacemaker generator sites up continuously, or systemic infection like endocarditis or bacteremia or both. Increased infection risk is associated with uh, comorbidities such as diabetes, end stage renal disease, heart failure, steroid use, history of device infection.
hematoma at insertion site and device replacement. Uh, sign and symptom include erythema, uh, pain, edema, warm, and virulent uh, discharge or non-healing incision. A common source of pocket infection is procedural uh, contamination with Staphylococcus aureus or Coagulase negative Staphylococci epidermitis. An infection pocket can also lead to a generator erosion uh, through the skin. This is a female patient uh, post pacemaker insertion, and you can see here the, gener uh, the generator of the pacemaker is eroding through the skin. So management, uh, three, site, uh, three set of blood culture have to be sent before starting IV antibiotic. Then start IV antibiotic, uh, ceftriaxone and vancomycin uh, is a, a good choice to cover staphylococcus aureus and staphylococcus epidermitis. You have to consult cardiology. A patient may require transesophageal echocardiography and removal and replacement of their uh, pacemaker. Uh, a tip, a pocket infection is endocarditis or bacteremia until proven otherwise. So uh, do not take it easily. Uh, management uh, with the pocket or systemic infection, deep infection lead to wire or endocarditis require device removal and antibiotic therapy. Two-step approach. Uh, st uh, starting with temporary basing uh, for the patient who is uh, pacemaker dependent uh, to bridge uh, the time between explanation and the new device implantation. Current guideline is recommend that waiting for 14 days after a negative blood culture following device removal for valve vegetation and waiting for 72 hours after a negative blood culture following device removal for the lead vegetation. Uh, the replacement uh, device to be implanted in alternate location for the initial site. Here another patient with um, uh, a generator eroding through the skin, and this is um, the base maker wires. There is vegetation over the base maker. Thromboflebitis incidence between 30 to 50 percent. Uh, the prevalent or uh, of the thrombophlebitis with pacemaker is high. However, symptoms presentation are rare because the patient develop collateral blood flow. And if the patient present with pain, swelling, or erythema to epilateral arm, then DVT must be considered. So management usually there is no treatment is needed for thrombophlebitis. Uh, you have to do a Doppler ultrasound to rule out DVT. If the patient is confirmed to have DVT, then uh, they should be started on anticoagulation with the usual follow-up for venous thromboembolism. Myocardial perforation incidence between 0.8 to 6%. Perforation can lead to pericardial effusion, pneumothorax, hemothorax, or even death. Risk factor include female gender, steroid administration, and advanced age. Sign and symptoms include chest pain, fatigue, fever, pleural effusion, and cardiac tamponade. Diagnosed by extreme dis uh, uh, distal location of the lead, uh, tip, and chest X-ray, and ECG basing pattern of right bundle branch block, and poor basing and sensing threshold. And fluoroscopy for or CT scanning may be helpful in localizing the lead tip. Here in chest X ray, you can see this is the lead perforating the myocardium. And this is confirmed by CT scan, showed this the lead is perforating the RV and it's in the chest wall. And also, you can see here this is hemothorax. So management, if the patient is asymptomatic or uh, there is no intervention is needed, just for observation. And uh, repositioning or replacement uh, of the lead wire if, um, if needed. Hemothorax or pneumothorax may require just a tube replacement. Lead dislodgement or break. Basemaker lead wire must be a physical contact with the endocardium 
uh, lead dislodgement is a common cause of failure to capture and failure to sense. Uh, we have a ratchet uh, traction effect, which is result in lead dislodgement due to loose tight suture, allowing the lead wire to move freely with the arm movement. The lead wire is pulled with the arm extension and is looped back around the, the generator with the arm is returned uh, to the natural position. We have also Twiddler uh, syndrome is another cause of lead dislodgement uh, resulting, from, uh, resulting from a twisting or rotation of generator with the subcontinuous pocket. By rotating the generator, the lead wire can become coiled and dislocated from the heart. Real syndrome is a variation of Twiddler syndrome in which the generator is rotating on the transverse axis of the pocket. Here, this demonstrates uh, uh, differentiate between the three syndromes. Twiddler is rotation along its long axis. So the base maker will uh, rotate along the long axis uh, in the bucket and uh, causing uh, coiling of the leads. Uh, real syndrome, it causes uh, rotation uh, on its transverse axis and also it's call, uh, it causes coiling of the leads. And here the ratchet uh, syndrome, which is uh, lead uh, pulled and uh, back uh, because of the arm movement. A chest X-ray and ECG are two necessary investigation to diagnose lead dislodgement or break. Uh, management, any sub, uh, suspected lead dislodgement uh, should be assessed by cardiology. Uh, depending on the patient, they may adjust the lead, replace it, or leave it alone. Um, consider lead displacement or perforation and uh, uh, if the QRS morphology change from the patient uh, previously based ECG. Here, just except for a patient showing a, a, a lead break, as you can see here. And also there is a coil of the pacemaker leads. Best maker malfunction incidence, uh, symptom of malfunction less than 5%. Um, it presents as uh, a failure to base, failure to capture, inappropriate sensing, over or under sensing, or dysarrhythmia. If the best maker does not sense uh, intrinsic ventricular uh, contraction, it may deliver an impulse inappropriately which can induce ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation. Starting with ECG and chest X-ray would consider the malfunction. So management patient should undergo uh, for pacemaker analysis first. If the patient is unstable, get the crush card, place the lead on the patient at the least 10 centimeter away from the pacemaker bucket and proceed as per SLS allogram. A magnet application will uh, convert the pacemaker to asynchronous mode and sensing will be de deactivated, thus preventing uh, continuous of free entry dysarrhythmia. This is uh, the image of the magnet and uh, uh, this is a, um, a patient who uh, having a cardiac arrest and that magnet was uh, applied to the pacemaker. Pacemaker syndrome, incidence between 5 to 80%. Uh, this syndrome is usually by loss of uh, atrioventricular synchrony. It is most commonly seen in VVI pacemaker, where um, the atrial and ventricle are not communicating. The atria contract against closed tricuspid and mitral valve, resulting in increased jugular and pulmonary venous pressure, uh, respectively. Patient can present with vague symptoms, including fatigue, exercise intolerance, weakness, dizziness, palpitation, presyncope or syncope, and neck pulsation. And rarely they can present with congestive heart failure. So management for pacemaker uh, syndrome treated uh, as um, mainly support, uh, supportive. In severe symptom, patient may require pacemaker parameter change to restore atrioventricular synchrony, 
it may require changing to base maker from single chamber to dual chamber base maker or uh, to dual ventricular base basing. Those, uh, those are my references. Thank you. Any question? Thank you, uh, Dr. Rashida. Anyone has any questions? Okay, then that brings us to the end of today's lectures. Thank you, everyone.